I'm really excited to be here with you guys today. Um, my name is Michael Kirby. I'm the pastor at Mount Pisgah Baptist Church in Ringgold, Georgia. And uh, my church wants me to send greetings to you. Uh, they're praying for you this week, praying for me this week. And uh, I just want to kind of tell you how things started off. I was leaving yesterday to come up here and uh, I got my kids together. And we sat down and I said, you know, you got to do the thing you got to do, right? You got to be good, listen to your mom, don't freak out while I'm gone. And uh, right before we left, I have a seven-year-old and a five-year-old. I have a seven-year-old boy named Cameron, I have a five-year-old girl named Sarah. And I said, listen, guys, I want you to pray for me while I'm gone this week. And Sarah, my five-year-old, uh, she's a lot like me. She says, Daddy, I'm going to pray that they don't boo you. So don't, don't boo me and you can answer her, her prayers. So... Um, but anyway, so we're, we're here this week to do revival, to be revived. And I think a lot of times when we come to something like this, we kind of have to ask ourselves the question, what does that even mean? You know, what does it mean to be revived? What does it mean to have revival? Is it just some services that we put together because we put them on a calendar and we do that? What does revival really mean? Well, my hope is, what I believe revival is, revival is saying yes to Jesus every moment of every day for the rest of your life. And so what we're going to deal with this week isn't rocket science. You know, really what God's been laying on my heart is, I feel like that if we as believers in Jesus Christ took Jesus seriously and lived by the things that Jesus taught and did the things that he wanted us to do, we would be in revival every moment of every day for the rest of our lives. Does that sound okay? So that's what we're going to deal with. And so the first thing that we want to deal with today is, what is the gospel? Really, what is it? To be revived, we, we have to know what the gospel is. We have to understand it and, 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 and relate to that and, 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 and accept it. Now, I want to set this up for you. We're going to be in the book of Mark. Turn to the gospel of Mark if you have your Bibles. Um, Mark chapter 1, we're going to be in verses 14 and 15 today. And before I read this, I want to kind of give you some context and set it up for you because it's important to, to do that. I don't know about you, but there are a lot of times when we read the Bible and, and I don't think we really kind of get the full effect of what's going on because we just kind of read it and don't think that this is a, a real historical thing. What we're going to be hearing today is from the words of Jesus. This is from Jesus' lips. And so I want to kind of put this out there for you. I want you to imagine with me that you have gone to a place and you're, you're waiting for someone to show up. You may have heard about this person before, you may not have, but, but you know somebody pretty awesome's coming and it's not me. Don't, don't go there. I'm, I'm not saying that. But you've shown up and you're, you're coming to hear somebody and you, you've heard they're pretty awesome. And, and the person that's showing up to, to talk to you that day is Jesus. Can, can you imagine that? There, there are people who live that literally heard Jesus preach. I don't know about you, but I long for the day when I get to see Jesus face to face and I finally get to hear him. Amen. And so that's what we're going to deal with today. Jesus is going through this region. He's preaching and teaching. And so people get to hear him. And, you know, in my mind, I like to think about this and I, I like to think, you know, what would it be like? What would it be like to hear Jesus preach? It would be a lot better than what you're going to hear today. <laughs> I can tell you that. But I want you to think about this. This is God himself. God himself is coming to us to tell us something very important. And so I want you to understand today that what we're reading is not just a story in a book. This isn't just something that we believe because we are good Christian people. But this is something that literally happened. God himself came and he had some very important words that he wanted to share. And, and here's the thing I want you to understand. When Jesus preached and when Jesus taught, the way he preached and taught was very different than the way the people were used to. What the people were used to was very stuffy religious guys getting up in front of them, and pretty much this is what their sermons always consisted with. I'm awesome, and you're not. That, that's kind of what the Pharisees did. They would go around and say, we're the only ones that love God because we do all these things. You don't love God because you're terrible and awful people. And so what the people were used to when someone would come to talk to them about God, this is the message that they heard. We're awesome, you're not. And I want you to listen to the message of Jesus and hear what he says because it's so powerful for them and for us today. So let's read in Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. After John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. 
Jesus came to them and said this very short statement. This was, we don't have all of his message, but this was pretty much it. The time is at hand. The kingdom has come. Repent and believe in the gospel. What does that even mean? Well, he says he uses two words here, and we need to kind of define those and explain those. Why do we need to repent and believe? See, this would have been something very foreign to the people that were listening that day. That group of people had never been told that they could repent of their sins. Now, they could offer sacrifices. They could feel sorry for what they've done. But there really wasn't any way they could be changed. Nothing for them. Because remember, there's a religious group of people and they're good. And these people aren't good. And Jesus comes along, God himself, and he looks at these people in the eyes and he says, Now's the time. The kingdom is here. You can repent and believe. But why do we need to do that? You know, these are two words that our world needs to hear more than anything today. Repent and believe. But why do we need to do that? Jesus is telling us there's something fundamentally wrong with what's going on. Uh, one of the first things that we see is that there is something desperately wrong with this world. Yes? There's something desperately wrong with this world, and it's boiled down to a three-letter word, and it's called sin. Every tragedy, every atrocity, everything that we look around and say, it shouldn't be that way, Jesus says, you're right. And what's the root cause, cause of it all? Sin. So Jesus says, we need to repent and believe because there is something desperately wrong with this world. But we also need to repent and believe because our lives are broken and full of brokenness. Yes? Yeah. See, here's the deal. Here's the deal. One of the things that we like to do is we like to pretend that we're okay. And we've gotten really good at it, haven't we? We can show up on Sunday mornings and, and we can wear nice clothes and we can comb our hair and brush our teeth and we can smell good and we can come in and we can put a smile on our face and we can look like everything's okay when our lives are full of brokenness. But here's the powerful thing you need to understand. The people that Jesus was talking to, that's all they knew was brokenness. They knew poverty. They knew this, this weight of spiritual guilt that they, they carried around with them with no, no way to get rid of it. Many of them were looked down upon in society. You know, the people that Jesus attracted the most? Prostitutes and sinners and tax collectors and gluttons and drunkards. All the people that we don't like in polite society, that's who Jesus attracted. And you know why? Because they were broken. And in their brokenness, as Jesus was speaking to them, and he's saying, you can repent and believe, they would say, my life needs to be changed. And one of the greatest things that we need to hear today, one of the, the biggest things that we need to understand in revival is, our lives are broken, and they need to be changed. You may be here today, and you may have a great, you, you may act like everything, you've got it all together. But can I just tell you, there's a Jesus here today who says, listen, your life's broken, and I can fix it. That's why we need to repent and believe. But what is repentance? If he tells us to do it, what is it? It's not a word that we use much anymore, right? That's a churchy word. You know, and, and if you listen to all the people, the marketers and the, the, the gurus, the people who know stuff about church, they tell you, don't use those words. I guess Jesus didn't get the memo, right? If you want to reach people, don't use churchy words. Sorry, Jesus, you, you, you're not reaching people, right? What is repentance? What does it mean? Repentance is our natural response to seeing our sin for what it is. Here's what repentance really is. When you get a good, hard, cold look at the darkness in your heart and the mess that you create with your actions and your thoughts and your lifestyle and you go, it's got to change. It's got to change. Repentance comes when we see that. And so I want, to, I want to read this quote to you because it's really powerful. It kind of gives us an idea of what, of, of what repentance is. It says, If the guilt of sin be so great that nothing can satisfy it but the blood of Jesus, and the filth of sin be so great that nothing can get out the stain but the blood of Jesus, how great, how heinous, how sinful must the evil of sin be. You ever thought about that? It's easy 
for us to say that we have mistakes and oopsies and we didn't mean to's. But when Jesus came to this group of people and he said, you must repent. What he's dealing with with them and what he's dealing with us is that sin is wrong and it's evil and it's much darker and it's much worse than we ever want to give it credit for. And you say, how can you say that? Because Jesus died for it. Amen. If sin is so bad that Jesus had to die to satisfy sin, to, 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 to take it away, to forgive it, how bad is it? So repentance then is coming to this idea that, that something needs to change. And this is what he's telling these people. Listen, something needs to change and you can change. And that's something they'd never heard before. Well, what they had heard in their culture and kind of what we hear in our culture is you can't change. Right? Whatever you're dealing with, whatever you're struggling with, that's just the way that it is. That's just who you are and you can't change. You're born that way. Can't change. I've heard too many people say, man, I'm just, I'm just angry. That's just the way that it is. That's just who I am. Wrong. And you can fit whatever you want to in that category. But these people and us hear the same thing. You can't change. You're right. You can't change yourself, but Jesus can change you. Amen. And it takes some, some effort on our part. The first thing that we have to do is we have to change our mind. We have to have a change of mind. Repentance, part of it is we change our mind and we begin to agree with God that our sin is evil. I don't know if you've ever done that before, but, but I have to do that on a, on a pretty regular basis. <laughs> you, you know, one of the things that really gets me about reading the Bible is, you know, I think I'm doing pretty good, and I think I'm a pretty awesome guy, and then I'll read something in the Bible and go, man, you ever get that? You know, I'm rocking and rolling and everything's good, and then I get this thing about, you know, let all your words be good, let all your words be encouraging. Yeah, that's not me. And then, and then we've got a problem here, right? We, we, we have to do something about it. We have to say, okay, God, you're right, and I'm wrong, and I need to change. Or we can do what we do sometimes, right? God, you're right, but really I wasn't that bad. Repentance means changing your mind. You begin to agree with God that when he says something is wrong, guess what? It's wrong, and it needs to change. But you can't just have a change of mind. See, that, that's easy. That's the easiest part. Just changing your mind. Yeah, I agree with God that it's wrong. What are you going to do about it? That's where we have a change of heart. Where we begin to hate sin the way that God hates sin. Now, I know that's not popular, but, but I could, if we had time, and we don't, if I had time, we could go back and we could look throughout the Bible where God hates sin. Now, it's very clear that God hates sin, but He loves sinners. That's different. God does not tolerate sin. God does not look on sin. God is too pure to have sin be in His presence. But God loves sinners. And the reason that God loves sinners is because He can change them. And part of what we need to do in repentance is we need to look at our life and say, God, I hate the stuff that I'm doing as much as you do. So, see, so many times we are enslaved by the sin that we have in our life because we love it. We love it. We practice it. We hide it. We protect it. And try, part of true biblical repentance or true revival is we come to a place where we change our mind and say, God, I agree with you. Sin was wrong. Sin's wrong. And then we change our heart and say, God, I hate this because I see what it does to me. I see how it destroys all these other people around me. I see how it, 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 it dishonors you. We come to hate it. But then here's what happens. As we change our mind, as we change our heart, then we have a change of direction. True biblical repentance is leaving our sin and turning to God. Now this is something that we do one time to kind of come into the family of God. This is called salvation. And at the end of this message, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that, to, to change your mind, to change your heart, and to change your direction. But this isn't something we just do one time. This is something we do all the time. Every moment of every day, when we begin to see things in our life, we go, God, you're right. I agree with you. This is wrong. And I, you're right. I need to hate this like you need to. And then we need to turn away. True biblical repentance is not saying, I'm sorry. It's saying, I'm sorry, as we walk away from the stuff in our life. Amen. We need to repent. 
But repentance isn't enough. We have to believe something. Now, I wish I could have been in the crowd that day. I really wish I could have been in that crowd and hearing Jesus speak and saying these words because I I bet it would have been electric. Because the people would have been turning to each other going, do you hear what he's saying? Do you hear what he's saying? Is this true? Do you think this means me? Do you really think that he means I can change? That I can can be saved? That I can be forgiven? That I can be transferred? Do you really think he means me? Jesus comes with another word. Believe. And what does it mean to believe? Well, let me tell you what it's not. Believing is not having facts about something. There are a lot of things that I believe to be true that don't have any effect on my life. Right? I believe in gravity, and gravity doesn't have any effect on my life until I fall off something. Right? I mean, other than that, who cares? You know? You you can believe in a lot. You can believe that Michael Jordan was the greatest basketball player that ever lived. And I do, by the way. (laughs) You can believe that your team is the best team in the world. You can believe anything you want to believe. But what does it really have, or what does it really matter in your life? When Jesus uses the word belief, he means something else. Jesus says that there's something that you have come to believe that not only do you believe, but it radically changes the way that you live. Radically changes the way that you live. So belief then is the natural response to seeing God and His gift of grace. It's funny how that works, isn't it? Repentance is when we see our sin and we see our nasty situation and we go, God, I need to change. Belief comes when we see God. When we see God and who He is and what He does, then we begin to believe. And the reason I would have loved to have been there that day is because I believe that the people in that crowd, as they were hearing him teach and preach, believed certain things, and it affected the way they lived. They believed that the circumstances of their life was because God hated them. The prostitutes felt that they were prostitutes because they had messed up sometime earlier in their life and God was punishing them, and that's why they were prostitutes. Those who had lost loved ones and family members, they had done that because at some time in the past, either their family or them had done something to anger God and God hated them. And so that's the lot in life that they had and it never was going to change. There were people in that crowd that day that, that was hearing these words and they were going, you know what, that, that sounds well and good, but, but I know because I've been taught all my life that this is never going to change. And Jesus says, I want you to believe I want you to hear the words that I'm saying and I want you to see the work that I'm doing and I want you to believe because I'm God and I'm here telling you this. I want you to believe in me that I love you, that I care for you, that I have grace to offer you in forgiveness and that you can change. Can you imagine how powerful it is? And God wants the same thing for us. He wants us to believe that we can grasp the gift of forgiveness. One of the things that eludes us so often in our life is, especially as Christians, is this idea of forgiveness. As Americans, we've grown up with this idea that there's no such thing as a free lunch. Everybody hear that, right? You don't get anything for free. And if somebody's giving you something for free, what do you need to do? You need to question that. It's probably not good. It's probably not worth it. And we need to work for it, right? We've got to earn it. And here's what Jesus looks at those people and he looks at us and he says, I need you to believe that I'm going to give you forgiveness. And here's a great quote I want to read to you about A.W. Tozer. He's a a wonderful pastor. Um, He says, we please God most not by frantically trying to make ourselves good, but by throwing ourselves into his arms with all of our imperfections and believing that he understands everything about us and still loves us. Do you know one of the hardest things for those people that day would have been is to believe that God could love them. To believe that God could forgive them. And you know what? That's one of the hardest things for us to believe, isn't it? That God loves us and God wants to forgive us. But I'm here to tell you today, as someone who believed that about 22 years ago, I believed it enough that I staked my eternity on it. I believed it enough that I walked away from a very uh, high-paying job to go into ministry. believed it enough that God has transformed me from the person that I was to the person I am now today. 
And I'm here to tell you that you can grab forgiveness. You can receive it. But you have to believe. Hebrews 11.6 Without faith is it impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. And he's a rewarder of those who seek him. Believe that God exists and believe that if you seek after him, God will reward you. So we believe that we can that we can grasp the gift of forgiveness. We believe that we can surrender to Christ and His kingdom. Man, I tell you, as a pastor, one of the things that wears me out, just, it, just, it just kills me on the inside, is people come to me all the time and here's what they say. I'd love to be a Christian, but I think it's just too hard. I love Jesus. I love the gospel. I love the message of grace and forgiveness, but that whole living holy and being pure and, and doing that whole thing and making it to heaven one day, can't do it. It's not going to happen. Because we don't believe and trust that God is who He says He is and will do what He says He will do. That He will forgive us, that He will transform us, and He will hold us and keep us until we get to heaven. Amen. First Corinthians chapter 6, I, I love reading this because of the first part it kind of sounds off. This is the Apostle Paul writing in, in 1 Corinthians 6, 9-11. through 11, He says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor the effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, if Jesus had spoken that in the crowd that day, there would have been a lot of people who said, Amen. That's right. Them sinners ain't going to heaven. Paul, having experienced the grace of God, believing in who God is and what God does, he comes up with this. Such were some of you. Such were some of you. Here's what he's saying. There, there are many of you in the church today that were all these things and more. Such were some of you, but you were washed. But you were sanctified. But you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of our God. Amen. Here's the thing. Everything around you, everything inside of you is going to tell you, you can't do this. You can't. You can't repent. You can't believe. And here's what God says. You can. Amen. You can. You can be changed. You can also believe that the Spirit can change you from the inside out. It's one of my favorite prayers to pray. God, change me from the inside out. Because how do we try to change ourselves? From the outside in. We try to change behaviors you know, we try to make the outside look better and we never deal with what's going on the inside. And only God can get in there on the inside and in the deep places that we can't get to. And He changes us on the inside. And what happens when He changes us on the inside? It shows up on the outside. One of the first verses I ever memorized right after I became a Christian was 2 Corinthians 5.17. If anyone's in Christ, they're a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. Jesus looked into people's eyes and told them something they'd never heard before. If you believe in me, if you trust me, if you follow me, the old will be gone and the new will come. Look at the raggly, taggly group of people that Jesus had around him. He took an uneducated fisherman who had a temper problem, changed him from Simon to Peter. He took one of the most ferociously anti-Christian people in the world. As the church was growing and being born, he was hunting it down and persecuting it. In fact, he, he, he submitted to people being murdered and put into jail. He took a man named Saul and he changed him to Paul. And 20-something years ago, he took a guy who was selfish and self-centered, jerk with a capital J, he saved me and he changed me. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? And so here's what I want to end with. What, what prevents you from repenting and believing today? I've been in the ministry a long time. I've been preaching a long time. 
And I know what happens at this time when we kind of start to, to make it personal and we start to kind of really nailing it down. Here's what happens. Your brain, your heart, and your emotions start kicking in. And there's a little voice in your head, and it's not the Holy Spirit that comes to you and says, this isn't for you. This isn't for you. You've done too much. You've gone too far. If people really know, knew what you were like, they would, they would shun you. If God really knew what was going on, He'd get rid of you. Here, here's the truth, loved ones. Here's what's amazing about the gospel. Everybody has to get in the same way. And the way is this. I am a sinner. And I deserve the punishment that comes from my sin, but, but I believe in Jesus and He has forgiven me of my sin and He's made me new. So if you're wondering about all these people who are church members, guess what? They're sinners just like you who are saved by grace. That's the only difference. So what keeps you from that today? I want to end with this quote. C.S. Lewis is one of my favorite author, authors. Uh, he's written a bunch of stuff. But <clears throat> this quote, it was in a, a kind of a book series that he did, and, and it was from the Screw Tape Letters. And if you don't know the book, you need to read it. It's really awesome. Uh, C.S. Lewis imagines what it would be like to have a lieutenant demon in the devil's army training a, a trainee demon and teaching him how to lead people astray. And here's one of the quotes that he gives him. He's, he's talking about how to keep people away from God. And so basically he's telling this guy, listen, you have to be careful when you're trying to lead somebody away from the enemy. It's, and it's kind of weird when you read it because he's using the word enemy in place of God. And so it's kind of hard to, to read through that. But here's what he says. The safest road to hell is the gradual one. The gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. Jesus understood that. That's why his message was simple and it was radical. Repent and believe. Here's the devil's message. You don't need to do anything about it. You can do nothing today and leave out of this place. And if you're not washed in the blood of Jesus, you've not asked him to forgive you of your sins and to make you new to pay for that, you can do nothing today, die tomorrow and go straight to hell. And you think, well, that's not fair. Hey, see, here's the problem. We've done so much. We've done so much. And Jesus has said it's so simple. If you repent and believe, you can be changed. But it's simple as saying, I, I just don't want to do anything. What keeps you from repenting and believing today? I, I want to ask you to do something. I want to, I'm, going to, I'm going to start with the simplest and kind of work my way up. Here, here's the simplest thing I want to ask you today. Would you be willing to repent of your sin and believe that Christ can forgive you and save you? You may think, whoa, 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 you, you started off way too hard. That's too hard. No, it's not. It's way simpler than what we think it is. I, I tell people this all the time. Look, this is the most amazing thing. God comes to you and says, if you repent, if you believe, I will forgive you. And, and please forgive me, but you'd be a moron not to do that. Right? I mean, someone is offering you the greatest gift that's ever been given. All you have to do is step out in faith and take it, and you go, yeah, thanks. I'm good. So I'm asking you to do the simplest thing. Would you believe? Would you believe enough that you will repent? You'll say, God, I need to change. And the only way that's going to happen is through you. So let's take it to the next notch a little harder. We all come with things, we all come with burdens, we all come with baggage, we all come with scars. Would you trust Jesus with the hurt and pain you've experienced? Would you, would you come with, to Him with that and let Him make you new? So, so much what happens in our Christian life is we have this moment of conversion. We repent and believe and Christ changes us. And then we just, we kind of have these experiences that happen in our life and they just kind of beat us down. And for the rest of our life, we just live in this kind of like funky, we love God, but man, we're not doing really well. If you can trust Jesus to save you, why can't you trust Jesus to change you? So it's a little more difficult. You, you got to come and you got to pour that stuff out. First Peter tells us that we cast all our care on Him because He cares for us. 
And then the biggest one is this. The hardest one is this. Would you trust Jesus enough to surrender your life to serve him every moment of every day? Go all in. And that may look different for you. But for some of you, going all in for Jesus today may, may mean this. I've kind of been on the fence, but I, I really think today that Jesus is the way. He's the only way I'm going to receive forgiveness of the sins. He's the only way I'm going to be made due. And so I'm going to put all my chips in on him. I'm going to stop riding the fence. I'm going to stop looking for other ways to deal with my sin or get to heaven. He's it. I tell people that Jesus is my parachute. If, the, if this plane called life is going down and my only way out of it is Jesus, that's all I'm taking. I don't have any other parachute. I'm not hoping on my good works. I'm not hoping on my church attendance. I'm not hoping on what my, my parents or grandparents did. What I'm hoping on is Jesus Christ, His work, His death, and His resurrection. That's it. Amen. That's it. What are you hoping on? Going all in for Jesus may be that you come and say, you know what? I've been coming here for a while and I really like this place. Maybe going in all, all in for Jesus means I'm going to join this church and begin to serve. Serve. Ultimately, though, I think going all in for Jesus is that, God, listen, I'm yours. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. I tell my church this all the time, and um, it's an amazing thing. I said, you know, there's no time clock on the outside of the sanctuary door. You know what I mean by that? You don't clock in and clock out of Christianity. Now, we've never done that at our church. Maybe you do here, but we, we, don't, we don't do that. You know, when we walk out of here, we don't walk with our little car and go, punch, I'm out till next week. I'm off duty. See, so here's the reality. We come in here to get ready to go out there and be on mission for Jesus. What we do in here is not nearly as important as what we do out there. Do you believe that? Do you want to live that way? Jesus came with a simple message. Repent and believe. There it is. What are you going to do with it? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time that we have together. And God, I, I pray in this moment, as you've been speaking to us and revealing yourself to us, that God, you would help us to respond in faith to you. Help us to, help us to take these concepts and put them into practice. So I pray for my brothers and sisters, God, that, that they would go all in for you. They would repent and believe in, in whatever way that you ask them to do. Be with us now. Glorify yourself in this time as we respond to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hello, this is Pastor Chuck Cotton from Calvary Baptist Church. First of all, I'd like to say thank you very much for taking the time out to either listen to our sermon or to watch it on video. We are grateful that you've actually taken the time and hope and pray that it has been a blessing to you as it was to us as we delivered it to our congregation. We ask if you have any questions whatsoever that you email us at Pastor Chuck at CalvaryBaptistMiddletown.org or you could come in and give us a phone call, if you would please, at area code 513-423-7251. I'd like to take this opportunity to also invite you to come to our church and visit us, if you would please. We actually have small groups on Sunday morning starting at 9.30 with our morning worship following at 10.45. Prior to our morning um, small groups, we also provide donuts with coffee, um, milk, orange juice, a time for fellowship, get to know each other, have a good time before we actually break out into our small groups for Sunday. Our worship services are uplifting, they're fast moving, and everything in our service is just a fast pace. But we do take time every once in a while to slow down as we feel the Holy Spirit moving, and we never want to hinder it in any way. We also have on Sunday evening, and during the school year, we have Awana, and Awana starts with the Puggles, actually from age two all the way up through high school. And during that period of time, we also have a worship service. Both of these start at six o'clock and end at 7.30. Our Wednesday night, we have a Bible study, which starts at seven, we generally finish about 8.15. We would love for you to come and visit with us. Don't have to dress up, just come as you are, because to us, it doesn't matter. You're, you're a child of God, a creation of His, and so to us, you're important to everything that we do. Our motto here is building the kingdom one life at a time, and we hope that we have a chance to visit with you 
get to know you as you get to know us. So thank you and may God bless you.